Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 97. Well, have you had a nice summer? Did you carve out some research time? I actually had a bit of a breakthrough of my own while putting together the new Google Earth for Genealogy Volume 2 DVD. I wanted to show in the video how to use polygons and paths. And so I decided to go back and use my great grandfather, Charles Burkett, as my guinea pig again. And you'll remember in the first DVD that I had an old photograph of great grandpa. And he was holding my grandpa when he was a baby, probably about six months old. And they were outside. And I knew it was taken in San Francisco, but we didn't know where. And we used Google Earth to identify the exact spot where that photograph was taken. I mean, that was a decades old mystery that was finally solved. Anyway, the Briquettes lived in San Francisco before and after the earthquake of 1906. In fact, my great-grandma was seven months pregnant when it hit. Can you imagine? Now, the Briquettes did a lot of moving around during the first decade of the 20th century, and I assumed that some of that was due to the earthquake. But I've always wanted to have a clear understanding of exactly what happened. So I did some searching online, and I found an old map of the city that outlined where the worst of the damage occurred. And most of the damage was actually a result of the fires that were set off by the quake rather than the 1906 quake itself. So long story short, and you'll see how this works in the videos, after creating paths, showing each of their residences and using some custom place marks and showing them in the order that they moved, I was able to create a custom polygon showing the fire damage. And it was like everything fell into place. It really hit home why they made the moves that they did. Their home, just before the quake, was just inside the fire damage area. And you could see it so clearly in Google Earth. And I just had never been able to put that information together. And you can see how they kind of moved further and further up the hill out of the damaged areas over time. Now, I don't know about you, but... Being able to plot all of the resources that I've been collecting over the years, you know, the census records, city directories, voter registrations, photographs, I mean everything. And then incorporate historic maps and information that I was finding in books. Being able to do that all in one place in Google Earth. Wow, it just jumps out at you. I think that's why I've become so addicted to Google Earth and have had such a blast putting these videos together for you. Because... It's the ultimate example of context. That's really what I think I've been searching for since I started my research. I really wanted to see it all in context. I want to sort of rebuild my ancestors' lives in a visual way that really shows me their story. Do you know what I mean? (laughs) And I can't tell you how thrilling it is to have finally found that in Google Earth. I hope these videos excite you the way they do me. Um, It's just pretty amazing stuff. And I'm sure the folks at Google never gave a moment's thought to genealogy when they were putting this together and getting it out there in the public. But thank goodness it's out there. I mean, so I'll make it my job to take these kind of online technologies and figure out how we can harness them to really bring our ancestors' stories to life. Uh, If you want to see a quick video on what we cover in the brand new DVD, just head on over to Google for genealogy.com and you'll find both volumes one and two there. And these new videos are only going to be available on the new DVD. We're kind of moving on to some other exciting video series in premium membership. The videos from volume one are available to view online as part of premium membership. So members can watch the first seven videos that were part of Google Earth for Genealogy Volume 1. Um, They're online as part of membership. But our new latest series in premium membership, um, which is going to be available probably through about the end of 2010, is on publishing your family history online. It is absolutely everything that you need to know about how to get it all done from the comfort of your home, even in your jammies if you want. And of course, 
We'd love to have you join us as a premium member. So just go to genealogygems.com and click the Join Today button if you'd like to become a premium member. So yeah, all these wonderful new videos that I've put together as part of Volume 2 are available on the DVD only, and that's at googlevirginiology.com. So let's see, what else did we do this summer? Oh, we had to do an unplanned uh, bit of kitchen remodeling at our house. <laughs> you see, I've been doing Jenny Craig since just before summer began. And of course, what that means is I am microwaving three meals a day. Well, my old built-in microwave threw a hissy fit, and right in the middle of nuking my cheese enchilada, it exploded. I mean, it scared me half to death. <laughs> cheese enchilada everywhere. So you know how it goes. We tore out that old mic built-in microwave, and next thing you know, we're retiling backsplashes, installing a new range hood, and once it looks good, you realize how shabby your cabinets look, and you just want to rip them all out. But <laughs> we resisted that temptation. And actually, it all turned out for the best because when they put that built-in microwave in, you know, 20 years ago as part of a remodel, they didn't leave enough clearance space between the bottom of the microwave and the stovetop. So even though I'm an avid canner, I love to can, um, I could never can quart jars because there wasn't enough room. Um, I, I know I've talked about uh, my love of canning and how my grandma taught me how to do that. I could only squeak through this short pot, you know, underneath that that microwave and do the small mason jars. Well, now uh, we have our new little microwave um, over on the counter, on another counter, and we installed a new range hood and retiled the backsplash. And without that old microwave, there is plenty of space for my big canning pot. I love it. So I have been canning peaches and tomatoes out of our garden um, all summer, and it's been wonderful. And I got to tell you, <laughs> it was so funny. Okay, so I've been doing Jenny Craig, and I've lost like 25 pounds, which I'm very proud of. Well, Lacey came home from college about a week or two ago, and I'm thinking, oh, she's going to notice that I lost more weight, and I have my next size smaller jeans on. And she comes in and gives me a big hug and kiss, and then she pauses and looks at me and she says, have you gotten shorter? <laughs> so does, does that mean I had a fat head? I mean, I don't know, probably, I, I don't know. But anyway, she finally figured it out. Yes, mom had lost a few pounds. So kids, what are you gonna do with them? <laughs> I tell you, but it was wonderful having her home and she is actually gonna be coming back home um, next month, I'm so excited, because the Family History Expo is coming to Pleasanton, California, which is in my neck of the woods, and she's going to come home from school that weekend and be there at our Genealogy Gems booth in the exhibit hall, and I'll be teaching a bunch of classes, and I think we're going to be doing a live podcast episode, so it's going to be a ton of fun. So um, stop by and say hi to me and to Lacey there at the Family History Expo if you have a chance to come by. Okay, well, enough about the trials and tribulations at the cookhouse. Uh, it is time for the genealogy news. The Genealogy Gems podcast has been in the news recently. Elise Dorflinger featured the podcast in her article called Podcasts Download Your Genealogy. And that article appears in the September issue of Internet Genealogy Magazine. Thank you so much, Elise. I know Elise has been a long time listener. I appreciate it. Um, and if you're a new listener who found the show because of her article, I want to say welcome. And we're so glad to have you joining us here. We'll try to really help you make the most out of your research time with lots of research gems and, of course, a good dose of fun. And one of those gems is the Chronicling America website at the Library of Congress. They just announced they've added more newspapers. On September 16th, 2010, the Library of Congress added more than 380,000 historic newspaper pages to the Chronicling America website, including newspapers from three new states, Louisiana, Montana, and South Carolina, and expanding the site's time coverage further back into the Civil War era. The site now includes almost 2.7 million pages from 348 titles published between 1860 and 1922, 
in 22 states and the District of Columbia. So you can check that out at chroniclingamerica.loc.gov. And I just recorded an interview with genealogist and author Lisa Alzo the other day for the next Family Tree Magazine podcast. And it was all about tracing your immigrant ancestors. And of course, one of the most important resources when it comes to immigration is Ellis Island. Well, it seems like just yesterday that we took our kids to tour the Ellis Island Museum in person, but gosh, it was nearly 10 years ago. And believe it or not, the Ellis Island Museum is celebrating its 20th year this month. September 2010 marks the 20th anniversary of the historic restoration of Ellis Island and the opening of its Immigration Museum. That was on September 10th of 1990. And the restoration was funded by the American people through the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation. It is really a world-class museum and has quickly become one of the most popular tourist destinations in New York City. They've welcomed over 35 million visitors to date. Amazing. And as you may know, they have a great audio tour that you can listen to as you walk the corridors of the buildings there when you visit in person. And you get to listen to audio recordings of the immigrants themselves who came through Ellis Island. And it really gives you a sense of what it might have been like. Well, in the most recent Genealogy Gems newsletter, I have an article there for you all about Ellis Island and the fact that Ancestry is now making more than 1,700 of those firsthand interview audio recordings available now for free online, which I think is tremendous. The link is there in the article to the recordings, as well as additional resources for you to trace your immigrant ancestors. If you haven't subscribed to my free newsletter yet, what are you waiting for? Go to genealogygems.com, click the sign up button there on the homepage, and you'll get the newsletter and the free Google Search Strategies ebook. Okay, well, first up here in the mailbox, uh, I have a message I actually received through Facebook from Belinda Slocum. She says, I'm not sure if you've covered it on the podcast before, but I don't remember hearing anything about what records might be generated by military dependents, military brats and spouses of military members. I ask this because I was born in England during my father's time there in the USAF. Also, both of my grandparents were career Air Force, so my parents were military brats. And I also have a cousin who was born in Iran during her dad's army tour there in the 1960s. I know about the records I already have, like my two birth certificates, one British and one from the Department of State for an overseas birth, and the military cards that we can carry after a certain age, maybe 12 years old or so, so we could go shopping at the BX and the commissary, and also to be able to get back on the base if we left to do shopping or sightseeing. My father's and grandfather's military records were destroyed in the fire of 1973, but I'm lucky because they both kept copies of information for their own files. We also have my grandmother's old military ID card. Do you know of a way to find out what records I might have generated that I should look for or make note of so my descendants will know to go looking for them? I know about passport records and that I might appear on my mother's passport for when she came back to the U.S. from England. I was a baby then. But I wonder what records my cousin, who was born in Iran, might have generated. My mother also lived for a time in Panama as a child, and I wonder if there may be some kind of record there. In England, we did not live on the base, so there could be rental records somewhere, though they may not exist anymore. If you have any pointers on things us military brats can do either to gather records or to let our future generations know about them so that they can go looking for them, that would be great. There are a huge number of people who've grown up as military brats, primarily in the last 50 to 75 years. So there have got to be a lot more records that we might not know about that could be found to shed even more light on family heritage. My being born in England and having gone to school in Okinawa has had a huge impact on who I am, and I want to make sure my descendants know all about it. Also, I may have sent you information on this before, but there is a fantastic documentary about military brats that is a quite a tearjerker, and I highly recommend seeing, especially those who want to know more about what it might have been like for a military brat family member growing up, called Brats Our Journey Home. 
I have a copy of it, and I want to pass it down to my son so he knows what it was like to grow up in a military family. Thanks for all your hard work, Lisa. I look forward to hearing more of your discoveries and tips. Belinda Slocum. Well, great question, Belinda. Um, I haven't covered this topic before on the podcast, but it sounds really interesting. (laughs) Now, I don't come from a military family, so I don't know off the top of my head some of the things that you're asking about. So I'm going to look to the rest of you out there listening. Do you have some ideas or some leads for Belinda? Have you ever heard anybody talk about this topic at a genealogy conference, perhaps? If so, drop me a line at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com, and I'll share it here in an upcoming episode. Maybe if there's an expert out there on these types of records, we could get them on to do a, a guest appearance. But one thought that does come to mind that I would probably do if I were in your shoes is to contact a military base that you live near or that you have ties to and talk to someone in their records administration office and ask them about it. Ask them what type of records flow through the offices from military families and where old records are sent and when they are sent. How long do they hold on to them? And do they go into some sort of long-term archival storage? I really look forward to hearing about your progress, Belinda, and also to hearing from the rest of you out there about what strategies that you might be able to share with Belinda and everybody else listening. Great questions. And I have an email here from Irma Dean Tilly. She says, Lisa, today while hand-watering flowers, I heard on my iPod your request for Genealogy Gems podcast listeners' scanner recommendations. Earlier this year, I heard on a podcast, I think it was Genealogy Gems, the announcement of Sally Jacobs' online and on-phone class called Joy of Organizing Photos. Information on this class is accessible at practicalarchivist.com. I took that class and I learned so very much immediately applicable to genealogy, although the class is not specifically for genealogists. Sally recommended the Canon CanoScan 200, if not also scanning slides. She has a different recommendation if scanning slides as well as prints. I purchased the CanoScan 200 and I'm quite pleased with it. It is surprisingly inexpensive and is lightweight, so I plan to take it with me on research treks. I cannot recommend too highly her class as mentioned above, and I found it thanks to you, Lisa, I think. (laughs) The class covers much more information pertinent to family historians than just organizing photos and has ample time allotted for questions. Irma Dean. Well, after receiving Irma Dean's email, I actually got a chance to meet her in person at the Mount Diablo Genealogical Society meeting um, just last week, I guess it was, where I presented Solving Family History Mysteries with Google Earth. So it was very nice to meet you, Irma Dean. And what a great group they have there. They're just wonderful. Um, Yes, I was the one who was talking about Sally's course here on the show. She is terrific, and I'm so glad that you got so much out of it. Um, I'll have a link to practicalarchivist.com on the show notes for this episode. I'll also have an Amazon ad there in the show notes for those of you who are interested in checking out the Canon CanoScan 200 on Amazon. So you can kind of take a look at it, see the reviews, see the specifications, and that type of thing. And speaking of scanners... Grace Dobush, the preservation expert at Family Tree Magazine, she covers scanners in the September 2010 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast, which we just wrapped up and it is now available at familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. And of course, you can always uh, search for it in iTunes. And listener Bruce Horn also chimed in on scanners. He writes, thanks so much for your wonderful podcasts. I have really found them useful as a beginner in the world of genealogy. Oh, terrific. Thank you, Bruce. I always love love to hear when people are getting started in genealogy. (laughs) He says, I just wanted to add my two cents to the scanner discussion. The good thing is that virtually any new scanner sold today will make excellent color and black and white scans. Some of them may have software that is easier to use and more reliable than others, though. If you only want to scan prints, I would recommend the Canon Lide, that's L-I-D-E, the way he has it here, uh, 100, mainly because it is small and it's cheap, about 10 by 14 inches and $60. As with most flatbed scanners available today, it gives great results. I have an earlier model of this at work, and we have found it very easy to use because it is so small and light. It is easy to hand it off from one desk to another when someone else needs it. It also takes up much less room on my desk than most other scanners. 
If you want to scan slides and negatives, things do get a little more complicated. For most people's needs, I think a flatbed scanner that also scans slides and negatives would probably work best. You can get separate slide scanners, but they get much more expensive and probably more than is necessary for most genealogy work. For this sort of flatbed scanner, I have always liked those made by Epson. Seems like Epson is really the winner out there, isn't it? I mean, I was telling you guys that's what I use, and it sounds like uh, Irma Dean and Bruce are both advocating Epson as well. He says, if all of the film is 35 millimeter slides and negatives, the Epson Model V300 for $80 is the one that you need. If some of the negatives are from old roll film cameras, two and a quarter inches, you need the Epson 4490 for $150. If any of the negatives are sheet film larger than that, four by five inch or eight by 10 inch, you need the Epson V700 for $600. The V700 also lets you scan more 35 millimeter slides at once, a big advantage if you have a lot of slides to scan. I have an older model like the V700, which is the Epson 3200, and it works great. I hope your listeners find this useful. Well, thank you, Bruce. I'm sure they will. And um, I'll have all the scanners that Bruce mentioned here in his email for you in the show notes so you can go check them out. Thank you. Ah, here's a message from Pat Kirkwood. She says, please help. I downloaded a podcast from iTunes, listened to it, but I cannot find it now. It has instructions from Lisa on how to organize your family documents on the C drive of your computer. I've already implemented it, but need a refresher on some things. So please tell me which podcast provided this information so I can download it again. P.S. Love the podcast. I recently discovered them and love, love, love listening to them. Ah, Thank you, Pat. I love, love, love that you guys all listen. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, okay, let me give you the rundown on where we had that information about hard drive organization. Uh, we covered that on the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast. That was a series, kind of a Genealogy 101 series. It's still available in iTunes. It was episodes number 32 and 33. So if you do a search in, let's say, iTunes, um, you can do just family history. The, the little yellow icon will pop up and you'll go to episodes 32 and 33. And I will have links directly to those episode show notes where you can also listen on the web in the show notes. I also produced a video for Family Tree Magazine on the subject, which is available at their YouTube channel. It was a companion video to an article that I wrote for the magazine. So we'll have a link to their YouTube channel where you can check out the, the video, kind of showing it to you step by step. And there are also two premium videos on the subject. They are part of Genealogy Gems premium membership where we go into it a little more in depth. And, of course, you can always become a member at genealogygems.com. So I hope that helps. Thank you so much for listening, and thanks to all of you for writing. Roots Magic 4 has been completely rewritten and is now even more powerful and makes building your family tree easier than ever. I love it. With Roots Magic, you can add unlimited facts, Find anyone in your database with lightning speed with Roots Magic Explorer. Quickly and easily create perfectly formatted sources with the Roots Magic Source Wizard. Create customized reports. And best of all, you can now take Roots Magic wherever your research takes you with the Roots Magic To Go, which lets you run Roots Magic directly off your flash drive. And Roots Magic makes it a snap to share your family history. Publish a book, create stunning wall charts, shareable CDs, even generate websites automatically from your data. To download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 4, head to rootsmagic.com. See why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. As you know, when I'm out speaking at conferences, I try to make the rounds and get a chance to sit down and talk with some of the most interesting and expert folks out there in the world of genealogy. And when I was at the Southern California Genealogical Jamboree in June, I did just that. I sat down with Susan A. Kitchens, who is a writer, a blogger, a graphic designer, an award-winning author, 
and someone who has an obsession for all things digital. She has the ability to translate technology into language that people can really understand. And in this gym, we are going to sit down with Susan Kitchens and talk about family oral history. That's her particular area of expertise and passion. Her website, familyoralhistory.us, is all on that subject. And in this interview, we talk about not only the ins and outs of how to get the best interview possible from the relative that you're talking to, but also some of the equipment that you need to be able to do that. Now, I want to forewarn you that sometimes when we're at conferences, we don't always have the best choice of places to be able to sit down and interview. And in this case, Susan and I were sitting in the front lobby of the Marriott Hotel. So you will hear some echo and you will certainly hear some comings and goings from the people around us. It definitely gives you a sense of the ambiance of a genealogy conference. But on the other hand, I do want to apologize that it is a little bit noisy. But the content here, I think, is so valuable that it's worth giving it a try. Here's my conversation with her. Well, thank you so much for joining me here on the show. I know that you were teaching some classes this morning, and I heard some people talking about them in the hall. I was right across the hall from you. And tell us what your specialty is and what you're here talking about at the Jamboree. Thank you. My specialty is what do you do to interview, to capture and preserve those stories from family members, and how to preserve that and how to use the computer to do so. I started out as a computer graphics geek. I interviewed my grandfather. He lived through the entire 20th century, and that set me on this task of figuring out how do I do this better. I'm a how-to writer, so I love explaining how to do this. And that's where my that's where the intersection of my interests are. So I'm really in it for the stories. And that's really what all of us want. I mean, you know, you kind of go digging around for names and dates, and then you very quickly realize that the stories are the key. And what better if you could actually get it on audio? Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, you've got a little setup here that we're working with right now. Tell us about, you know, how complicated is this if we wanted to be able to go and, and have a little setup that we could sit down at a holiday gathering, a reunion, and really capture some of the stories right there on the fly? Well, the there are actually quite a bit of offerings in the digital audio realm. The last decade has seen so many, and in, in my session this morning I went through, here's how to make sense of it all. But if you have an iPod, there's a microphone that you can plug into it. Yes. And so you can basically record something that CD stereo quality sound, uncompressed audio, that's a WAV file format, W-A-V. So if you've got an iPod, there are those kinds of things. You've got other ways that you can basically plug in a sound system to your computer going through your USB. Mm -hmm. That's another method. So your computer becomes the one that record the, the thing that records, and it gets fed to by a microphone and and digitized and all that through the USB path. And then there is there is another category of recorders. It's a flash memory recorder, and that's portable and handheld. And so there are things like I was just showing you the the Zoom Handy H2, which I see as sort of like the entry level recorder and you can get it at Amazon for around 150 bucks and the why I call that entry level is because I like to record on a recorder that does full uncompressed audio because I think this you're, you're preserving this I can read family letters that are 80 years old what are they going to be listening to 80 years from now when they're listening to our voices and we're still like not far removed from the first generation that has been able to capture the sound of the human voice. I mean, yeah. people have been telling stories. The cave paintings are 32,000 years old, and we've been telling stories for all that duration. But it's only our fathers and our fathers' fathers who have been able to capture the sound of the human voice. And with digital video, I mean, and video, but with digital video, the human likeness of the face all animated as somebody is talking yes. and telling a story and remembering and recalling. So. I th I've got the long-term view, and so I say you use some sort of a recorder that does full uncompressed audio, 
that's a WAV format. And so the, the Zoom Handy H2, that is one digital recorder. It's all in one. The microphone is included. There's another one that's got a really nice one button push. It costs it costs more, but that's the Marantz PMD 620. And on my site, I've got an equipment section that kind of walks you through all of that. It's like, you know, I want to be your resource for making sense of how it all works and and which one to get. And I've got a store that, it, that explains what it all is and stuff like that. But you can get yourself, you know, if you've got an iPod for under a hundred bucks you can get something to add to it that will set it up to become your recorder or you can get a flash memory recorder that costs a little bit more or then there's something else that you can plug into your computer and let your computer do the recording when you feed it audio. Exactly and it probably depends on how much you want to invest, how much, how many interviews you may think you have due and probably in what uh, situation you're going to find yourself in. Um, and you mentioned the uncompressed versus compressed files, and I wanted to kind of get to that right up front so people would know what they were looking at, because it's a lot like photograph files. Exactly. Some are compressed and lose quality every time they get changed, and some aren't. So um, tell us what the difference is, and of course, my question, of course, would be, don't you have to kind of deal with size? Right. You know, certainly Wave and everything is fabulous. It's a wonderful quality, but then you're dealing with a huge size, which means a bigger file, which means maybe a little more challenge to email. So tell us what our options are. Now, in the year 2010, file size is not an issue. One of the things that I showed people, I said, this is Moore's Law, and that is that, you know, as, as computing time continues, you know, every 18 months you get a doubling in computing processing power. And so I said, here, let me illustrate it for you. See this compact flash memory card? In the year 2000, I bought this 64 megabyte compact flash memory card and I paid 200 bucks for it. And I went to a conference in the year 2006 and I was given a thumb drive that was a freebie capacity, 64 megabytes. Right. That's how things go. It's like, you know, now you can buy a, a card, a, an SD card that's got a four gigabyte capacity on it. That's enough to record CD stereo quality for like seven hours. Mm -hmm full whatever and if you've got a DVD burner on your computer you can basically burn some data DVDs off of that 4 gig card because a DVD is a capacity of 4.7 gigabytes right. and we have that now and this trend is only going to continue so I say go for the full res now of course if you want to send this to somebody you make a copy of it and you compress it using like mp3 or AAC or what's also known as .m4a and those are a couple of compressed audio formats but the thing is is that it if you start with a full file size that's your master mm -hmm. and the deal about the lossy compression it's like the difference between a TIFF file and a JPEG file is it once you compress it to become a JPEG file for instance to put it on the web once you throw that data away you can't get it back so you want to have something that's full size to begin with and the problems of the expense of large file sizes eh, you know that's that's kind of been solved mm -hmm. it's been solved by now so some of it is uh, knowing your delivery method yes if you know how you're going to deliver it if, it, if you're just going to have to email across the country but keep your master that's exactly the, the big file and then give them the compressed right and right. still you'll have the, the archival quality if you will Although if you create, you do an interview and you say, okay, fine, let's take this and make a, you can create an audio CD. It's what's called the Red Book Audio Standard and one disc at 650 megabytes or whatever. That's about an hour's worth of audio. And so you burn these audio CDs, which you can listen to in your car or whatever. And the nice thing about doing something like that is if you create a set of discs to give away, then you make multiple copies of this. And there's this, there's, when it comes to data safety, there are people in the archiving and institutional yeah. academic stuff, and they've got it. There's a word called LOCKS, L-O-C-K-S-S, -S, and that stands for lots of copies keeps stuff safe. <laughs> so rather than emailing this thing across the country, burn some disks and let it get delivered by snail mail and then you've got a good full set of copies yeah. that somebody else has and so if the unforeseen happens it's like hey can you like give me a copy of this you 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 distribute this among family and in a mm -hmm. sense you are both sharing and archiving at the same time if you're doing it with full resolution audio 
That's a great tip. So let's talk about you finally got somebody to sit down to talk to you. And that was one of the things you addressed in your class was, where do you start? What do you ask? Yes. What do I ask? I get the question. <laughs> to Susan, give some good stories. Susan, I'm going to go visit my uncle so-and-so. What do I ask? And there are several approaches. One thing that you can do is think about this person's life. Like, when was he born? When or she was born? What year? And I've, I've got something on my website, it's like a spreadsheet, and I know there are also genealogical apps that allow you to do timelines, and you sort of look at, like, you know, okay, my dad was born in 1929, that was the year of the crash, okay, so that means that he grew up during the Depression. If you, if you put things out in a column of, like, how old were you, what was going on in the world, and what was going on in your life, like, okay, I know you lived there, and I know you did this, and a person goes through, you know, I mean, you're young, you got parents, you got grandparents, you got siblings, then you went to school, what was your favorite subject, what were what what you know what kinds of things did you like to do when yeah. did you what did you want to be when you grew up they're kind of like you think through the stages of life and you come up with questions you work through this life stages of like okay so you were born during the depression so let's ask something that's based in history like oh then you were a teenager at world war ii so you didn't serve so like how what was what was your understanding of how the war came about and you know what was your reaction to hearing the news of the atomic bomb and you kind of piece that stuff together and once you put this out on a grid, it's like the questions start asking themselves. Mm -hmm. And so that's one way of working through a kind of a life structure. Great. Another one is to look at a person's decision points. You know, you make major decisions in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, I decided to go to college. I decided to major in this. I decided to go into this direction as a profession. I decided to marry this person. You know, we decided we we're going to move from here to there. Those are like major life changes. And you can ask about any one of those and, eat and get into things such as, well, you know, what were the factors you were weighing when you decided to do blah? Or was there anybody that was opposed to that and how did you deal with the conflict? You know, and it's like the kind of follow-up questions all around that reveal what were the historical circumstances at the time, what factors were you weighing, what other things were going on, you know, what was, what was, what was choice B and what was the attraction about it and what did choice A, how did that finally win out? And so you learn about what a person evaluates to say this, that I'm, you know, I'm a person like X because, because this factor, you know, mm -hmm. I, I wanted to pursue creativity. And so obviously creativity is something that I value and that tells you something about me, you know, as well as whatever was going on at the time. You get all sorts of circumstances and stories there. Oh, there is something I haven't yet mentioned and that is when you are interviewing somebody, you start with asking open-ended questions. So it wasn't, did you take vacations as a kid? Well, yes I did, or no I did not. That's a closed-ended <laughs> question. Yeah. I mean, it's good for sort of pinpointing some information, yeah, but rather to say, what kinds of things did your family do when you took vacations? And you, you can almost hear this, well, I, you know, and then out comes a story. And so your job as an interviewer is to elicit stories from the other person. And you ask these open-ended questions. And I actually heard a podcast recently by a personal historian, and there was a, there was a relationship specialist whose name I cannot recall. Sorry. Mm -hmm. and, but she was talking about something really important, and that is to have within your mind this attitude of curiosity and not judging. So it becomes, I am curious about you cousin Lisa, mm -hmm. let's say, I'm curious about you and I just want you to know it, it's okay, you're safe. I'm not judging your life when I'm asking you questions about it. I just want to know what it has been like for you. Mm -hmm. And so the sense of I am eliciting stories, that's my job, and I am curious and I am non-judgmental and I am asking open-ended questions, that right there governs a lot of how somebody who doesn't know anything about interviewing can have a good experience. Mm -hmm. And if it's family, you can say who happened, what happened there, whatever. And there's a, there's, why is tricky? Because among family, it's like, why did you do that? Could very easily be, why did you do that? Yeah. Because why is not, you know, when, when that's asked by parents, they don't want to know why. They want to let you know that that's not okay. And so if you can find a way of asking why differently, like what were the factors that you were weighing at the time? What was going on at the time that that happened? You get to 
the, an answer that would be why, but you do it being curious yes. and non-judgmental. Knowing that just the word choices can elicit a, a closed down response versus an opening up response. Right. Well, and even, even the, I've looked at the work of Deborah Tannen who does, she's written the book You Just Don't Understand and Talking 9 to 5, a lot of what happens in communication and she's got another book called I Only Say This Because I Love You and it's about talking among adults to adults in a family. And she talks about the difference between connection and control. It's like we're on this continuum. Well, I want to say this to connect with you, but you mm -hmm. may hear this as you're controlling me. And so, you know, Mom, I want to talk to you to interview about your life stories. What, are you saying I'm a bad mother? You know, that there's, that it's What are you very, trying to dig up? <laughs> right. You're trying to control me, or this is critical. Mm -hmm. And so there are kinds of, there's a set of landmines to navigate there, but but I really like this. If you are curious and you are non-judgmental and you kind of think about what are the ways to deal with this that you may be able to get around that. And, I, and before we were talking, you were actually telling me that some people say, I want to talk with somebody, but, but there's this reticence or something. And I think one way that's sort of like the opening way to get into telling stories is can we just sit down with a recorder going and you tell me stories about the people in this photo album then it doesn't become something where it's like well you know I really my life has been not very interesting and I don't really have something to say or I don't want to talk to you about that because because I don't you know, I'm not telling you this, but maybe I don't trust you or whatever, but it's like, oh, photos, information about what's over there on those particular photos. I can deal with that. So, so talking through photos might be a good way to sort of introduce yeah. the way of doing this. Well, who's the person in this photograph? Uh, you know, and, and so what do you know about that? And then you can, you know, you can get from, tell me what's going on here to what do you remember about that situation? So it's almost like you don't want to be too narrow but you really don't want to be too open-ended because the big, huge open-ended of tell me about your life becomes overwhelming instantly. So it's somewhere in the middle. The first question that I asked my grandpa, and I mean, he was, I showed up there to hang out with him and he was the one that got me started with this. Since he had, for his 99th birthday, he had just been given a tape recorder. Aww. And, you know, tell stories. Don't talk to us about what you don't like about politics and economics and all the rest of it. Tell <laughs> us the story of your life. Because he lived through the entire 20th century. And, yeah. And the man had stories. And so I was like, I don't know what to do with this. You know, okay, fine, I'll pop it. You know, but I'm not a cassette tape works and so I popped it in and pressed the record button and my first question which I played for the people today was okay grandpa what's the meaning of life and he goes oh god and we all busted yeah we all busted up and it's and you know a series of specific questions about what happened here and what happened then and why did you make this decision and tell me what you remember about so and so and how do you think that life is you know what's the generation gap that you experienced when you were young with your parents versus how it was when you were parenting. I mean, a whole set of questions like this will amount to what is the meaning of life. Yeah. But it's a lot easier to answer, yeah, those, those medium range questions that are open-ended enough that will result in telling a story without, without just saying, okay, so tell me about your life. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about you were mentioning photo albums. And you could you could go down and say let's let's use that as the catalyst for the conversation, and I heard a great idea the other day where somebody was saying you know you can go on Google Books and pull up Life Life magazine, and go to a decade of the 40s and let's just wander through the covers of Life magazine. What were you doing? Because sometimes they don't remember the year, but they remember it because it was next to the landing on the moon. Right. And then that gives them a context to work with it. Does that seem to fall in that, line with that? That's that's another one because because you're working with you're working with memory triggers and yeah. Life magazine is a memory trigger. The photos are a memory trigger because somebody may say, Oh, I don't know, I don't remember anything. And you start asking questions, you start probing, and they begin to remember more and yeah. more. Which so don't have just one interview, have another one because the first one is just gonna prime the pump. But anything that helps somebody remember and the good part about looking at Life Magazine or looking at a photo is that you, the interviewer, have something that you are looking at that's out there in the world versus whatever it is that's in the mind's eye of the person you're talking with. Because you, you don't see the movie that's on the screen yeah. inside their memory. 
And so you can say, well, you know, what about this fashion thing? Or how did people react when this happened? And it's just really great to get a perspective on history because, because history is in the books. Yeah, uh, you know, the newspaper or the news is the first draft of history, but then it's something that we've all lived through. Mm -hmm. And so as you page through this, you know, so what, you know, what did happen with the first moon landing or what, you know, like I asked my mom about the 60s and she was like, you know, everybody was talking about we, but she remembers it as a decade of death, both deaths in the family and then the, the national tragic deaths of, of both Kennedy brothers and Martin Luther King Jr. And, you know, that's, that's her impression of it. So, yeah, there's, and, you know, other things she was telling me about growing up in California and, and worrying about all of us because of the atomic tests that were happening in, in the next state over in Nevada. And so, yeah, looking at the newspaper, that's a great way to pull for stories. What were your recollections of that? Wouldn't that be interesting? You could even go to a, a website that has old newspapers and start with, okay, well, then let's pull up the, the headline for the year you got married and see what was going on. And, and then maybe that becomes a trigger. So there's lots of creative oh, ways yes, to do it. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And there are so many resources on the web. I mean, it's it's... How many different ways can we do this? There are so <laughs> exactly. many different ways. Yes. Well, so you you were teaching people, and I'm sure that uh, the the wheels start spinning, and, you, and people start realizing that this is very possible. What's next for you? You've been doing interviews for quite some time. You certainly have kind of figured out the setup of things. Mm -hmm. um, what are what are your plans down the road for Susan Kitchens to pursue this whole area of helping people get these stories? Well. Personally, I've got my father's histories and my uncle's histories that I want to finish working with and donate to the Veterans History Project. Oh, awesome. That's so anybody who has got a veteran in the family, you can you can do this and actually donate it to some this like very public repository and that's right. at loc.gov slash vets. So that's personally something that I want to do. But I've got a, my website, Family Oral History Using Digital Tools, which you can see at familyoralhistory.us US. I am working on some more how-to information there and I'm going to begin posting some more videos and screencasts and let them go step by step and it will eventually become an instructional DVD because I got into this when I was interviewing my grandpa 10 years ago I was actually revising a book about a computer graphic software product okay. and so I've got the I've got the how-to chops and I just love combining the Here's how to do this with family, mm -hmm. with that how-to chops, and so I am going to be coming out with materials that will make it easy for you to figure out how to do this yourself. And also, can they find out about future spe speaking engagements if they get an opportunity to see you live talking about this topic? Or me on video, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yes, indeed. Okay. That, that information is there when I've got, well... I'm going to be speaking, I think it's early November, at the Conference of the Association of Personal Historians, which will be held in Victoria, BC, British Columbia. It's a beautiful spot. Yeah. And I'm going to be talking about digital tools to people who, whose business is personal history of, so that they can understand what's all this digital stuff yeah and also talking about how can you use Photoshop so these are people that are that are professionals but I don't know what their policy is I mean if you happen to be in in that area I don't know what it is but that's that it's is something there. that's coming up later on this year awesome well it's a great subject and I think you've given us um, a great launch pad you know not only some tools but some questions and of course the most important thing what get started now oh yes yes I can say this having interviewed my father. My father died last October, and the last time I interviewed him was actually in January or February of last year. So this would be January or February 2009, and he died in October. And so I have gone through that experience of when you have an ailing parent, there comes a point where you say, I am so not interested in like getting information from you because we're dealing with the day-to-day -day care aspect. Yeah. And, uh, and you just, if somebody's sort of like getting towards that, oh, honey, now is the time. It is mm -hmm. not, now is the time. And 
The other part that's that's wonderful about having done this, having interviewed my grandfather, having interviewed other family members, is that I am so glad I have got the sound of their voice. I am so glad I spent this time getting the stories that I, I'm so glad I had the opportunity to get to know my grandfather during his 90s and that I've got these stories and heard them and can preserve them. It's something that is so... I mean, I've, I know what tragic death is, and when my grandfather died, I just found myself that day going, wow, I am so glad I did this. And so it's just, to feel that, just that sense of how good this is mm -hmm. was such a gift, and it is such a gift. And, and so between the part of when they're ailing and what you can do now and what it feels like afterwards, I am just so glad that I'm doing this. And what a wonderful way to have some way to spend time together when there are very few things that you can do at that point in a person's life. But um, boy, they go out knowing that someone really cared and wanted to know. Thank you for sharing your story. I hope that it inspires other people to share theirs. Yes. Oh, thank you so much for this opportunity, Lisa. I'm so glad we did this. Me too. <laughs>
It is going to be Google all the way. <laughs> and it's going to be me doing four classes. We're going to have a whole day event. We're going to do lunch there. It's going to be a ton of fun. And we're going to cover a wide range of topics and just have a blast. It's always fun. So Google all the way. And that is coming up on October 30th. We're going to be wrapping up Family History Month with the California Genealogical Society. Head to CaliforniaAncestors.org for more information on that. And of course, um, by the time you hear this, I think uh, our new DVD, Google Earth for Genealogy, Volume 2, is going to be about a week away from shipping. So if you want to reserve your copy, head to GoogleForGenealogy.com and you can uh, pick up your copy there and we will ship it out the day that it arrives. So thanks again for listening. If you have any questions or comments, you can reach me at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.